the live edition of Health Unabashed on Healthcare Now Radio. The show looks at the thought-provoking ideas, people, and companies who are making a difference. I'm your co-host, Greg Masters, and with Gil, we explore the opinions and insights of our guests on how to connect the dots to create sustainable change. Learn more about the show on the program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And now let's hear from Gil on what's in store for today's episode. Greg, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. It's always great to join you, my friends, and always really fascinating and inspiring to be with great people in medicine who are making a difference in the world. And today we have two such exceptional people. We have Dr. Louis Aroni and Dr. Catherine Saunders from Wild Cornell. I've had the pleasure of being on their radio program, Weight Matters, just a few weeks ago. And I have to say that it was a pleasure to get them onto this program. I, I felt after our conversation, we had really just scratched the surface. So Dr. Aroni and Dr. Saunders, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for taking a break from your busy clinic schedule at Wild Cornell at the Weight Management Center, which really is a very pioneering group for our, our nation. I also want to acknowledge the fact that both of you are uh, very much so uh, digital health pioneers. You've created uh, essentially a cloud-based community that takes a look at making weight management care available to people all around the nation, whether they have close proximity to an expert such as yourselves or not. The concept of having access to information, access to expert medical care and therapy is right at their fingertips, thanks to the fact that you see your work at Wild Cornell and your research as really having national import. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Gil. Thanks for having us, Gil. No, oh, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, you know, something I've I really wanted to explore, and, and Dr. Saunders, you're you're in the you're in the crux of this. Of course, you're in tip-top physical condition. You're you're fully vaccinated, you have booster, you're on the front lines though of care, and you have COVID right now. And I want to thank you for coughing, putting your coughs aside. And um, and uh, putting on a special mic, a mute button at the ready if necessary, uh, but joining us. You know, we we often think of of weight and all the ramifications of weight as like something you can take care of tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. It seems to be that thing that is always sort of put off into the future. And I'd love to get your perspectives as clinicians, pioneers in the area of of obesity and and weight. Um, has weight suddenly become an acute condition um, in light of the COVID thing? And Dr. Saunders, you're you're dealing with COVID. Dr. Aroni, you're you're clearly speaking to us today with your wonderful equipment in your office. So wait, uh, put off till tomorrow. Get on it today. What do you both think? Definitely get on it today. The one of the the good things that's actually come out of the pandemic um, is is the focus on obesity. Um, we can't, we can't ignore it anymore. We've seen now that, that people who have obesity have had worse outcomes from COVID, more hospitalizations, more intubations, more death due to COVID. So the fact that now the world has had to really take obesity seriously is, is actually one of the maybe only good things that have, that has come out of the pandemic. Dr. Oni, what do you think? I agree completely with Dr. Saunders. Uh, if you look at it, it's um, obesity is sort of the mother of all comorbidities or illnesses that are interrelated. Uh, as fat cells expand, a variety of hormones are produced in excess that cause inflammation, increase your blood pressure, uh, make you resistant to insulin. And this leads to the more than 200 illnesses that we associate with obesity and which also cause uh, worse outcomes in COVID. So it's it's become uh, really clear that the uh, damaging part of obesity has been brought out by the COVID pandemic. So I, I want to swing to that because I, you know, had um, I've had three guests on the program. We've talked a lot about um, how employers, companies that pay for employee benefits, and and that's about fifty-two percent of the employers of our of, of people of our nation 
get part of their health insurance paid by their employer. And effectively, it's a benefit. If you don't offer health benefits, of course, there's a fine under affordable care, and there's therefore another route for people to go after. But but let's face it, I, I, I'm not really certain our nation has a health care system. I think it has a sick care management system. We don't really do anything to make people better. Now, both of you did extensive research. Dr. Rona, you were really the pioneer in this. And I remember seeing you walk the halls of American Heart Association scientific sessions, cardiometabolic um, meetings and so forth. We were talking about you know, triglycerides and cholesterol and, and um, a blood pressure and all that. And you were really at the forefront of looking at this in a multidimensional way. So I, I just want to bring it back to this, in a way, accru- acute chronic component do we have enough mobilization of understanding that weight, obesity, I mean, overweight, overweight, aside from how you feel or how you look, it is really the mother of illness. Um, now, if we talk about this of saying, what could, what's the one big thing we could do in this nation to reduce comorbidities and reduce the cost of health insurance? Am I, am I overreaching if I were to say, get America to trim down one way or another um, could really make a huge difference in our health bill? I I certainly think so. And I think a growing number of uh, experts in the field are thinking the same way. We've finally gotten to the point where we can get people to lose and maintain that lost weight, for example, with surgery. And we're seeing that these types of treatments can save money. There can be benefit as well as cost savings associated with even high cost treatments. But the best approach would be to stop it in its tracks. So let's look at other treatment models that are out there, like hypertension, classic disease. Um, If your blood pressure goes up, we start treating it as soon as your blood pressure gets to 140 over 90. Well, back in the old days, back in the 50s, they would treat you if your blood pressure was 200 over 130 or 140. I mean, just unthinkable today. And as a result, treatment didn't work very well. And they didn't have many medical treatments available. It was in the 60s when better treatments became available. Medical treatments became available, but still quite uh, you know, with, with many side effects, that they were able to prove that you could prevent strokes and heart attacks by treating people at a blood pressure of 170 over 120. And as time has gone on, we now recognize if you start treating at 140 over 90, or even earlier for that matter, you can prevent all of the complications that we associate with hypertension. I think that ultimately we're going to be doing the same thing with obesity. We may be using the same medical model. I think we'll be using a medical model in addition to more aggressive public health measures, but we won't wait until people have a body mass index of 50. Uh, the, The way we do now, we'll intervene at a much earlier point. So I I, I want to sort of swing into this sort of cultural aspect. There's a whole movement now about, and I'm very sensitive to this, um, you know, people's mental health well-being. We we talk about body shaming and and to obviously to avoid body shaming, heaven forbid, um, um, you know, certainly attacking the person or or diminishing the person's well-being who's dealing with a weight issue is is certainly not going to help anybody. But in between that and doing nothing, what, what would you recommend? Because what's clear, everything we know and see is that um, obesity or, or even, I'll, I'll try to trim it down, being even 15, 20 pounds overweight has a very clear impact on cholesterol levels, on triglyceride levels, on, um, on glucose levels, on prediabetes that graduates to diabetes, to hypertension, to, I think there are, and you'll, you'll correct me, you probably know much better, you do know much better. I think there are eight different cancers that the, the tripping point is definitely weight is, is shown to be a, a factor. I had a, a guest and a friend, John White, who's the chief medical officer of WebMD. He just wrote a book about risk reduction, reducing your cancer risk. One of the components there is, is diet and weight. Um, what is it going to take for us to engage in the conversation or physicians 
um, to engage in conversation with their patients uh, uh, at a level where they, the physician is comfortable, their customer, their patient is customer, but we're getting to the crux of the issue. You're overweight, and for your sake, for your family's sake, we, we need to engage. What, what, what's going what's gonna to change that's a great question. I think, you know, one of the issues is that there's just not enough education and medical training about what obesity is, why it's a disease, how we even speak with patients who have obesity and, and most importantly, what to do about it. So many providers just don't even bring it up. Um, either because they, they don't know how, they're not comfortable, they don't have enough time in visits. There's so many barriers to effective obesity treatment. Um, and then beyond just providers, um, there's a sense that, that people can just eat less and exercise more and they can lose weight and keep it off. But unfortunately, that's just not the case for the majority of people. And so the first step is to educate as many people as possible that obesity Obesity is a disease that can and should be treated medically. Um, you know, you're talking about the whole, you know, body shaming, body acceptance movement. We're all for body acceptance, but when it gets to the point of body acceptance because you feel like you can't do anything about it, that's when, you know, we get up in arms because people can do something about it. You know, there, there aren't enough obesity medicine specialists right now. And that's why we, you know, started our company to um, expand access to care, but we're out there and, and uh, expanded access is coming. And so, you know, seeking help is, is something that can lead to very good outcomes. We have treatments that are very effective. They're very safe. They work. Um, and there's so much that, that we can do. Now, I'm going to pick up on on um, what you and Dr. Aroni have have launched. You um, you obviously you know Dr. Aroni pioneered this whole area of, of science, and you joined him. Um, you often refer to yourself as as really one of his first and pioneering proteges in, in the field. And then both of you went off to create in telehealth. Um, and you know, often when we take medicine out of the medical institution, while Cornell is one of the nation's great teaching hospitals, great great hospitals of science, uh, but when we take medicine out of the institution and we say, you know what, we, we need to bring it to the nation. We need to we need to actually create a business model. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be curious about that from a sense of um, how the business model has enabled you to go out and have greater impact and reach. Because this is, I, I think health obviously is a very personal issue. It's a cost-effective issue as opposed to sickness. Health is less expensive than managing illness. Um, but I, I don't know um, if business that's paying for health insurance, they're paying billions for health insurance, and even insurance companies have really sort of looked at themselves and said, wait a minute, um, the, the system really isn't working for if you're, you're a payer, it's not working for my customers, corporations. And if you're a corporation, you're looking at your employees and saying, I don't know if it's working for my employees. Um, how, how do you and how do you both now operationalize to make your message so potent, powerful, clear that people start to sit back and say, you know what, um, just like, like a big pothole on a highway, that is ripping tires and slowing down traffic. We've got to we've got to repair the road. Weight is the pothole on public health. Obesity is the pothole of public health. Now we now need to get out there with the construction crew and and trim down America. So I th I think we have been coming through a, a pivot point in in the field because of the availability of data which didn't really exist before. What insurance companies have done, for example, and looking at their own employees, look at BMI, um, you know, someone's weight versus their height compared to how much it costs for their healthcare. And they are seeing themselves firsthand that people at higher BMIs cost them much, much more money than people in the normal BMI range. So that, you know, if they look at where 
excess money is being spent on health care, it's in the high BMI range. And they're seeing this again and again and again. And so insurance companies are now beginning to get interested in treating obesity. And we've developed model programs with an insurance company, and we were able to show that it worked just as well as our program. Uh, and right now, what we're doing is analyzing data, looking at whether or not we actually have saved money, but in a very short period of time, even a year or two years, can can you save money? This is going to be like wildfire. We already have studies showing that you can save an enormous amount of money in uh, people with a very high BMI, if you get even modest amounts of weight loss, those are the people who who really cost the healthcare system so much. So, but just for our listeners, Dr. Roney, I, I I mentioned to you and uh, Dr. Saunders once before that I'm the opposite COVID nineteen person. They talk about the COVID nineteen people gaining nineteen pounds. I, I've used the period to I uh, no actually trim down nineteen pounds, and uh, you know I wanted to use myself as a test tube. Um, um, and from that, of course, my um, triglycerides reduced, my cholesterol re reduced, my my blood pressure, which was normal, actually went down into the 118 over 70 some odd range. Um, you know, I, I I can speak from personal experience, not having been uh, having weight to lose, but but still wearing the same size clothes, it still fits me really well closes the button and all that. But I look better. I don't deny that. I feel better. I'm healthier. Um, so I, I would be very curious to know because you're clinicians, you're scientists, you're you know pioneers in research. You've both presented at many conferences of note: cardiometabolic conference, AHA, ACC. Uh, I'm sure many, many, many other conferences. You've published papers, um, and you've also become entrepreneurs. You're the you're the intel inside of an enterprise. You're you're obviously dedicated to Wild Cornell but you are the leading medical advisors to IntelliHealth. I would be very, very curious to know, you're sitting, you're talking, you're, you're, what, what happened exactly where you both looked at each other and said, you know what, we need to operationalize this and bring it to a different model. We need to help people all around the country. What, what was the, we're going to do that. I've been thinking about this for a really long time. Um, you know, I edited the, uh, National Institutes of Health Guide to Obesity Treatment, which was 21 years ago. And uh, when when this volume came out, it was this uh, thick, it was about a half inch thick, and it had all these instructions for doctors, what to do, how to get people to lose weight. And I, I said to myself, there is no way that a doctor in practice can do this. You know, here I am, I have this busy practice, uh, patients come from all over the world, we get them to lose weight, how are we going to turn this into something that the average doctor can do? And the answer was in digital therapeutics, by digitizing all the materials that we had, and delivering it in a semi-automatic way and having all the tools that are necessary to monitor patients, we've been able to take the exact same approach that we have shown now over years, over decades, is effective and make it available to doctors around the country and patients around the country. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because when we think of your work, um, you know, I often think of, of both of you, and certainly you're you're so well known. I mean, you've appeared, uh, Dr. Ronnie, on on, uh, on talk show television, on um, you know pretty much every major network, and um, uh, both of you have been on radio programs and interviews, and probably People Magazine. I wouldn't be surprised as well. Uh, and now you're digital health pioneers, you're digital therapy pi pioneers. What's your thought about the, the the convergence between medicine and digital therapeutics? I mean, you're you're really pioneering many different areas, and you're making it practical and um, with an output. How how do you both feel about that? 
You know, when you take a look at the numbers that 74% of the country has either overweight or obesity, I mean, that's astonishing. And the field of obesity medicine is certainly growing, but not fast enough to accommodate everybody who needs our help. Um, I'm literally still one of fewer than a hundred fellowship trained obesity medicine physicians in the entire country. So technology has to be part of the answer because, you know, we just can't see everybody in our offices. There just aren't enough obesity medicine physicians. The American Board of Obesity Medicine certifies physicians each year, and uh, there's still fewer than 6,000. It's growing rapidly. It's it's the fastest growing field of medicine, but again, not, not fast enough to accommodate everybody who needs help. Um, so using technology um, is, is an amazing way to really scale and democratize access to, to what we're doing. That's, that's really such important. You know, I, I think that the, the other aspect I really want to explore with you just for a second, if I can, is um, the issue of, of um, health equity and obesity. And I often reflect from my tenure with the American Heart Association as a as a as an affiliate chair, a member of committees and and, and different regions, um, you know, working with volunteers, that um, are we doing enough to reach diverse audiences? And you know, people have different levels of background and um, comfort with the medical system. When you look at obesity and obesity management specifically, um, What's your thoughts about the racial divide and the problems we're facing here specific to obesity? Well, it's been recognized that obesity uh, is more prevalent in lower people of lower socioeconomic um, uh, background. And it's interesting that in women, it's the lower socioeconomic background and men, it's upper socioeconomic background. So. Um, why why is that? What is going on there? And it may have something to do with what people eat with availability of certain types of food. But the, the bottom line is, you know, you think about it back in the old days, people who didn't have a lot of money would be thin, they would be skinny because they didn't have enough money for food. Now, what people do is they buy uh, highly processed foods, sugar, fat, starch, and that triggers obesity. That causes something physical to happen in your brain that allows you to accumulate more body fat. So not only is it the cheapest source of calories, but there's a growing body of evidence that it triggers something physical that makes you continue to, to gain weight. It's almost like a ratcheting phenomenon. And, and that's the reason, by the way, to get uh, started treating your weight problem as soon as possible, because weight's a one-way trip. It doesn't go down, weight goes up easily. It doesn't go down very easily. Some type of continual effort is necessary to keep your weight down and at a, at a lower level once it gets to, to a higher level. So one of the questions is how, how do we get the kind of treatment that's necessary to uh, those in the community and those of in, in lower socioeconomic brackets? And that that's a tough problem. And again, we're, we're trying to solve that with IntelliHealth. Uh, you know, we, we think that this is a kind of tool that can be used at institutions around the country and, you know, all the care that's necessary, everything a, a medical center needs, it's all in one place. It's ready to deliver. We have less than 100 or 100 trained fellows in obesity, I think Dr. Saunders mentioned. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about if I were sitting with a primary care physician and they wanted to address a, a GI issue, a gastroenterological issue, they'd refer me to a GI specialist or a cardiologist or an oncologist or a nephrologist or you know, a, a pulmonologist. Um, but for some reason, um, primary care physicians hold on to these patients. And they say something like this, you, you need to lose a few pounds here. The next time I see you in six months, why don't you uh, trim down a, you know, five to 10 pounds, see you in six months, and goodbye. And I'm wondering if the system itself actually is part of the epidemic. What has to happen in the sort of the American Academy of Family Physicians 
or the you know the American College of Physicians for people to say, you know what, we in a virtual world we need to put this person in touch with a specialist because otherwise they're a, a medical risk waiting to happen. What is it going to take? Is it policy? Is it is it more science? Is it your you know, sort of storming the gates? What what is necessary to get the medical system to realize that their patients are most certainly there's no question about it their patients are at clinical risk for some form of event whether it's type 2 diabetes or stroke or heart attack or COPD or poor quality of life that weight is actually almost like a tipping point for danger these are fabulous points skill and there's so many different barriers to access of obesity treatment. Um, Part of it is policy, part of it is advocacy, um, part of it is educating healthcare providers, part of it is educating lay people that, uh, again, that obesity is a disease that can and should be treated with specialized care. And so until there are enough obesity medicine specialists where a primary care doctor can refer to obesity medicine just as they refer to gastroenterology or cardiology or pulmonology, some of this care has to be done in the primary care setting, which is really difficult. I want to thank Dr. Aroni, Dr. Saunders for being with us today on Health Unabashed. It was great to speak with you. I hope to be speaking with you again. Continue your great life-saving work. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us, Gil. And that's a wrap for today's broadcast. We want to thank our listeners for taking the time to tune in. You can learn more about Health Unabashed on the program page at healthcarenowradio.com. We stream live weekdays on Healthcare Now Radio at 2.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., and 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Or for you left coasters, 11.30 p.m., 7.30 a.m., or 3.30 p.m. Pacific. For previous episodes on demand, check out the Health Unabashed show page on healthcarenowradio.com. Let's keep the conversation going with Gil and me on Twitter by connecting with us at Gil underscore Bash, that's B-A-S-H-E, and Greg Masters, M-P-H, Greg with two Gs, or by the hashtag Health Unabashed. And for on-demand listeners, please consider liking and subscribing to the show on the podcast platform of your choice. Until next time, stay unapologetically passionate about improving health.